Now, for our Builder Series today, uh, we're going to have our own Bree Ray come up and introduce Rob. So let's give him a hand. I am Bree Ray. Welcome to Review. I'm glad you're here. AJ and Tigran, great job. Thank you so much. Let's give, give them one more round of applause. We have an incredible guest with us here today, and we are so blessed to have him. Robert Bishop, guys. After five successful business ventures and exits, Robert has turned his focus to strategic consulting. He'll be covering all things from getting started to getting going and how to succeed in the race of entrepreneurship. So let's give it up for Robert Bishop. Come on up. You're on a couch. Oh, no, wait. I want to see where the lighting's better. There you go. So it's here. And I have over here. <laughs> I think over here's better. Yeah, you're going to look better than me. Okay, so. Darn. Done <laughs> Sorry about that. Robert. Is Robert. anybody wearing a tie? I just have to know. Nobody? Oh, listen, I am, I, I'm embarrassed to even have a collar on today, may I say. <laughs> I, uh, we're moving, and so all of my clothes are packed, and I found this is the only clean shirt I have. <laughs> Darn. And so I put it on, and I thought, oh, this is way too formal. <laughs> and so I'm going to apologize for that. I, I would prefer shorts and a t-shirt. I'm sure someone's here in shorts and a t-shirt, and you... And you look great. You deserve the accolades. <laughs> So shorts and a t-shirt, is well, that see, part the of the Robert is, Bishop I've, brand? I've always felt like if someone cares about what I'm wearing... <laughs> then I'm talking to the wrong person. True. So, I would agree. That's just me. And that's something, something you run very highly in your brand, so you believe in? <laughs> brand. In your brand. Tell me about the Robert the Bishop Robert brand. The Robert Bishop brand. Tell there us is more. no Robert Bishop brand. If I were <laughs> doing the brand thing, I, I would have more than zero friends on Facebook. I've had a Facebook for 12 years, I promise you. I have zero friends. Because I only use the dumb thing as a login credential for other sites. Log in with Facebook. That's what I use it for. Uh, Twitter, yeah, I have one of those too. I've about five years now. I've tweeted like a dozen times. I think I have the, the record for the least amount of tweets. Um, I do have Instagram. I love it. It's just for family, and I do all my crazy, funny things with that. I take pictures and put captions that I think are funny. It's just for the family. And then there's LinkedIn, which I love. And so I post on LinkedIn about entrepreneurship, startups, and anything that my no-filter brain thinks of. And so it's basically all over the place, and I love it. I do videos, and I do uh, articles and posts, and there you go. So, and you do a great job. And I have no business card, so if you want to connect to me, the only way is LinkedIn. So Robert Bishop, like the congressman, but I'm not that guy. <laughs> I don't know what those guys do. So. so, so Robert, then how did you get into business? How did you decide you wanted to be an entrepreneur? Yeah. Were you born that way? Was it a choice? Yeah, I think for some, uh, they're natural at entrepreneurship, and that's the case with me. Um, you know, when I was younger, I was always thinking about uh, things that I could do that were uh, business-like schemes. Um, even in high school, I created my own little company, and it was just me. And I think at the time I was making $18, $20 an hour, which back in that day would be like $50 an hour today oh, as a 17-year-old. Okay. So it was uh, great. Uh, I didn't really think that I would then become an entrepreneur, you know, as I went to school and went to the university and thought, well, I have to study what I'm going to be. And that was a big conundrum for me because I didn't mm -hmm. know what I wanted to mm -hmm. do. Uh, and then kind of fell into it from there, <laughs> which I could explain, but, you know. And you fell into the tech world, or was tech what you were always interested in? No, I wasn't, I wasn't a tech guy. I was at, uh, I was at BYU, and I was studying uh, cor classes that I thought were interesting, so business-like classes, because uh, I was interested in business. So math and business and accounting. And, and I was driving by this company... And it said com something computing service on the, on, the, on the company. And I wondered, what kind of jobs do they have? 
And so I actually just drove right in the parking lot. I went into the front and I said, uh, are you hiring? Do you have to have specialized training? You know, and oh no, we're hiring a computer operator. And so let me get you the person. And I met with that person who then took me to the director of operations. And I met with that person who pretty much wasted my time because at the end of this interview that went on for like 45 minutes, the guy tells me he had already given the job to somebody else. <laughs> and I'm like, why are you talking to me? Well, of course, I didn't come out of my mouth, but in my mind I had that. I had that. <laughs> Usually it comes out of my mouth. But he said, we're hiring a computer programmer. And usually we take someone from operations, but nobody in operations wants to be a programmer. And so, would you be interested? And I'm like, well, sure. But please understand that the only computer I have seen is the one on Hawaii Five-O. That's the old one, Hawaii Five-O. Tape drive spins around. You probably don't even know what that means. Tape drive spins around, disc packs that you mount, mainframe computers. And so I agreed to uh, meet with their development head, and that guy was pretty to the point. He just said, hey, would you mind uh, taking an aptitude test? And I, I did. It was a time test, and it's one of those tests when you're done, you have no idea if you got any of them right. And, uh, and then he disappeared. And a few minutes later, I heard all these people laughing. <laughs> and I peek around the corner, and they're looking at this test thing that I did, and they're all laughing. And I'm thinking, where is the door? How can I get out of here without being seen? But I couldn't, so I sat there. And it wasn't the greatest, you know, comfortable feeling. And the guy comes back in, he starts telling me about how great the company is and how they have like a catered dinner in the winter and a barbecue in the summer and sometimes they play croquet at lunch. Seriously, that's what the guy says. And I had to say, stop, are you offering me a job? And he said, well, yeah. And I'm like, well, you know, I kind of heard the laughing, so I saw that. He said, well, we've got this, this guy here. He's really a jerk. And he is this self-proclaimed genius guy, walks around, tells everybody how smart he is, and you scored one point higher than him. <laughs> so you get hired no matter what, because <laughs> we hate that guy. <laughs> So that's how I got into tech, and I started as, I was a professional programmer, never having programmed. And I trained for a couple of months, and then I began writing financial systems for banks and savings and loans and credit unions, and migrated from there to uh, the PC when that first came out, and uh, then migrated from there to start my first tech company, and all that happened within a couple of years. And I didn't plan it, I just, it just kind of fell in place, and almost got pushed or forced yeah. into it, so yeah. So how did that um, tech experience influence the companies that you then started? Well, I love tech. I, I loved computers. When I got involved with computers, I went right into computer science because they do exactly what you tell them to do, <laughs> as opposed to other Very relationships obedient. that I have that they do not do what I say, like my kids, for example. Uh, I, I would never say my wife because she pretty much tells me what to do. <laughs> And are you obedient? I am. Good. That's what we People like to People ask me, well, what is your job title? And I say, uh, usually I'll say it in Italian, schiavo della moglie, which means slave to my wife. <laughs> she sounds like a great woman. Oh, she's yes, fabulous. She she's sounds amazing. She, yeah, I don't deserve her. <laughs> Robert, can you tell us a little bit more about the companies that you started and then sold? So I did, I've done two software plays, and those you can bootstrap. You know, you don't have to have investment capital. I did a SaaS, software as a service. I loved that. Um, and those you can bootstrap. And then I did two hardware, and you really can't bootstrap that stuff. You know, you basically have to have investment. I brought this last one that I did was a video distribution system. This is the little box that we built the board inside the box from the ground up and everything that you see here. And basically, you just plug a video source into this port and then out to the TV. And you can do that any, at any of your TVs, and then the boxes talk to each other and allow you to route any source to any display. So my Apple TV could be over there, and I can watch it on all my TVs at the same time. And we built that for the custom integrator market, you know, the smart home, smart office. And uh, we, we were a little late getting it out because we didn't quite pass our uh, FCC thing <laughs> the first time. So, uh, but once we did get it out, about uh, within three months, we were cash flow positive, and within nine months after that, we were bought. So, wow. it was a, that was a quick one. 
Good, good. What, was, um, what were some of the biggest obstacles that you faced as you built all of these companies? Oh, uh, everything that you do has an obstacle. Mm-hmm. And what you have to do as an entrepreneur is you have to see that obstacles are your friend. They really are. Because if it's an obstacle for you, it's an obstacle for your competition. So rather than look at it like it's an mm-hmm. iceberg that's going to melt with time and then you can go on, you just got to go over it, under it, around it. That's what you do. Uh, my favorite, the one that I laugh about the most, is that my fourth company, I did an in-room entertainment system for hotels. So it was a little box like this that on the back of the TV and a toaster oven-sized server that sat at the property head end that had all the movies and the concierge information and what to eat, do, or buy nearby. And... Uh, we then had to get content for that from the movie studios. So I went flying to Hollywood to meet with the studios. And I just thought, naive me, that the studios would love this opportunity because we were 25 cents on the dollar to our nearest competitor. And I thought, they're going to love this. And, our, and we tested with content, and we were four times the revenue of our nearest competitor. So five, four times the revenue, 25% cost. We're going to just bust this thing. We're going to disrupt that whole market. And no, they didn't really even care. You know, it's like if you're not Steve Jobs, they're not interested in talking to you. And uh, I remember my first real meeting. We sat down, and the guy said uh, they had their content security group come in, and they're very interested in what's called a DRM, the digital rights management, so that you know people can't rip off the movies. And you know, if you're going for high def content, they don't want their movies out there even though they freaking leak them all the time and you can torrent them, they were worried about us. So I sat down in the meeting and the, and the content security guy, uh, we were with uh, 20th Century Fox because they're the toughest on security. We thought if we get them, we get them all. And the guy said, well, what DRM are you using? Because they have approved DRMs. Well, we built our own. And so I said, well, we built our own. And the guy let out an expletive stood up and said, not another homespun, garage-built DRM, and kind of walked out of the room. And I thought, what do you got against garages? <laughs> and then the guy, the business guy, came, he went out, and they had their little conversation. He'd come back in and said, you know, the problem is, is that uh, you know, we don't have the ability to audit this, and there's only like two companies in the world that can really do this. And so if you want to go get audited, then we'll do it. And here's the company we really want you to use. So we used them. It cost us 50 grand. They did the audit. We got the highest security rating they offer, which is called criminal enterprise, which means that you're robust against attacks at the criminal enterprise level. So I had my little summary letter. I got my meeting with Fox again. The security guy was there. I slid the piece of paper across the table. He picks it up. He starts looking at it. He says, no way. There's no way you got this in four months. How did you do this? And I said, well, we built it in a garage. <laughs> I literally did. I couldn't help myself. And the guy said, no, I want to see the full report. And I said, no, you don't get to see that. That's a security breach. <laughs> so, no, you've got the summary. That's all you asked for. And then that guy was done. And we passed, and then we went on to license content. But I'll tell you. Wow. It was laughable how I actually believed that they would want to license their stuff and they could care less. Wow. So of all, and I'm sure you have several experiences. Oh, for every, every company you do, you're going to have dozens of these. So then what advice would you pull from those experiences to give to the young entrepreneurs? What advice? Um, well, my favorite advice for entrepreneurs is all has to do with the beginning. Mm. You need to vet your idea. And there are ways to do that that are scientific. I like, personally, the uh, wow factor test. Uh, Gary Rhodes, uh, who's a marketing guy at BYU, just left. Uh, He has that that he developed as kind of a a take on the six hats Mm. of parallel thinking. Uh, I would do that. There's actually a consulting group, uh, wowfactorconsulting.com, Eric Espinoza. It's a great way to find out if your idea is worth pursuing. Mm. And it's much better than saying, I have this great idea and building this thing, and then 
investors and whatnot, and then finding out you didn't hit the mark. Right. So the first thing is to vet the idea. And the second thing is to vet the business model behind the idea. Once you've vetted the idea, yes, we score high enough. Now, how are we going to do each piece of our business model? How are we going to take it to market? Who are our mm -hmm. partnerships going to be? You have to vet all that stuff. And that's, that I would use uh, any one of a number of business model canvases that are out there. But you do all that stuff kind of in a manual way before you ever automate, before you build your MVP, just fake like it's there. Yeah. You could go create a website in two <laughs> seconds that offers this thing and send a mailing and it doesn't even exist. And then you say, thank you very much for, try for providing us data. We did the same with our little in-room entertainment system. I actually installed it in a hotel and we put content on there and people, we'd see if they buy. At what price would they buy and under what terms would they buy? We had like mm. this, the the single purchase idea. And then we thought, no, throw that out. Let's do the Netflix thing. Let's just say it's 10 bucks a night. Watch what you want. Can we make money? And then they'd go to pay in the next day and there was no charge because <laughs> it was all a test. It was all fake. And we were, all, we were running it with a lot of equipment in a room. <laughs> when they wanted to stream that movie, we were there doing it <laughs> because <laughs> it didn't exist. But that's what you have to do. You have to vet the business model. So you vet the idea, you vet the business model, and, and here's, the, here's the key. Fail quick, fail small. That's it. Because you are going to fail. Only one in 200 ideas really make it. So are you that smart that you're the one in 200? I'd say no. Assume that you're not. Fail small, fail fast. That's kind of, kind of small, is, is, that, is that counsel that you're looking for? That was great counsel. Uh, <laughs> I, feel, I feel renewed. Good. I feel great. Well, you look great. So. Well, thank you. Uh, Robert, you mentioned you. And, you, you and said, you're comfortable on camera, apparently. I saw you stand up. Thank you. So that's good. <laughs> no, um, Robert, you mentioned that we were in the back clicking, like, stream the movie. Oh, yeah. Yes? Yeah. So I'm assuming you had some partners. Oh, yeah, always. How were the partnerships in your businesses? So my first company was me. I started the dumb thing. Uh, and when I exited, I didn't have a partner. I owned the whole thing. Mm. But I treated it like I did have partners. Mm. And I took the funds, a portion of the funds, and I divvied it out. When I started my second company, and from there forward, I've always had a co-founder. Maybe not at, on day one, but I always found a co-founder. And really, at the end of the day, everybody in the company is my partner. Right. So we, we had one exit that was, uh, well, we've had two exits that were particularly good eight-figure deals. Th those are really good days. You know, not, not nine or ten or, uh, where's Ryan Smith? He, what, what number is he up to? But he's got a lot more digits than <laughs> anybody I know. Anyway, uh, when we exited, I think uh, the receptionist made three times her annual salary, and wow. most people got to pay off their houses. Big deals. And... And if you're going to carry something to conclusion, you better make sure people are incented. I always say to them up front, this is where you find out, are they a wannabe or are they true? Mm -hmm. The wannapreneur, the wannabe entrepreneur. You tell them up front, would you rather get paid a competitive wage and benefits and whatnot and have little to no upside? Mm -hmm. Or would you rather get paid... Possibly less than you could get market, but with a, with a back end. And the answer is not both, by the way. The answer, and then you write it down, they sign it, and that's how you run it. Because wow. that's what I, I want the people who are in skin in the game like me. Because, you know, they, they, they're working really for themselves, but they're also working for right. the team. So I like that. And a lot, a lot of times I feel with so much skin in the game with entrepreneurship, yeah. there's also a lot of stress levels. So how do you personally deal with the stress of entrepreneurship? That's a very good question. So um, first of all, I am a cyclist. So when I introduce myself and people say, what are you? I say, look, I'm a tech entrepreneur. I'm a movie lover. I'm a cyclist. I'm a family man. This is who I am. <laughs> Cyclist is one. I like to spend time on my bike. It helps me with stress. Um, that said, um, most of the time, all I have to say to myself is, 
this is nothing. This is nothing. Um, I, it, when I was younger, my first wife passed away of a horrible neurological disorder. Mm -hmm. And I found that I had five kids that were that had a 50% chance of dying the same as their mom. And I was running a tech company and trying to be caregiver and dad and mom. And when I think back to that time, the stuff I go through today is nothing, nothing. So I don't really even worry about it anymore. Because what's the worst that can happen? You fail. So freaking what? You know, you go and you do the next thing. That's what it is. So I'm sorry, I got a little personal there, but. I like it. I like that's it. the that way I great. look at it. So freaking what? Somebody write that down. What a quote. What a quote. Yeah, it's one of my Mormon swear words. I have, <laughs> I have more of them, if you'd like to hear. There's a whole list of them. Just sprinkle them throughout. How about that? <laughs> Try not to. Perfect. Um, Robert, as far as mentorship goes, yeah. how did you have any mentors that stuck out to you? Is mentorship something that you feel oh, like is huge. really important? Mentor, mentoring is huge, and I'm a huge give-back person. This is one of the things I say to people. You don't wait for your day in the sun or the exit or whatever yeah. to start giving back. You have to give back from day one because you don't change who you are when that event takes place. You are who you are. So don't say to yourself, oh, I'm going to be yeah. this great philanthropic person or whatever. Forget that. Just help along the way. As far as mentors in my life, you know, number one would be my dad. I mean, he saw at an early age that I was kind of not going to go the institutional way. And so he provided ways for me to do things that people didn't do in that day. Um, I would say second of all, there's the lunch club, which is a thing that I used. Everybody has to eat lunch. And so if I had a problem, I would find an expert or two in that area, and I'd take them in each individually out to lunch, mm. and I would then tell them what I was dealing with and sit and listen. And then when I get back to my office, I'd take the stuff that matched up between the two experts, and I'd look at that stuff really careful. Oh. And then I'd figure out how to tweak it for what I did. And that's one of the things that I don't particularly care about these uh, influencer types that are out there, these wannabe influencer people. Uh, because they talk and they rah-rah me to death, you know. Rah, rah. <laughs> but they don't really give me the way to do it. They just talk yeah. principle. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Tell me what you did, and then I'll tweak it for what I do. That's helpful to me. So, The lunch club. So the lunch club is great. I, I would use that. Um, I also think that life circumstance, life circumstance in and of itself is the great teacher. I don't know if you believe in a higher power or God, but you learn when you're not comfortable. And when, you're, when you get lifed, I, I'll say it that way, when you get lifed, you're going to learn. You have, there's no way around it. You're going to get lifed. I've been lifed on all sides. On all sides. <laughs> At the same time. Oh, it was great. So during all this lifing, yeah. were there any surprises or lucky breaks? Lucky breaks. You know, I'm just dang lucky that the mistakes that I made were not catastrophic. Mm. So I have lost many battles, but I've never lost the war. And I feel very fortunate. I would say that's, if you want to call it luck, um, I kind of talk about it a little bit differently. I mean, there's stuff in your life that you can control, you can control that you're competent in what you're doing. You can control your work ethic. You can control your integrity. These are key. But then there's the stars and being aligned with the stars. Now, you may start out aligned with the stars perfectly, and then they may shift. And you can't control that. But what you can do is pivot to realignment. So I would liken it to... Let's say you're sailing, and you're sailing to port, and you got the lighthouse there, and you see it, but if you put your head down, even though you are perfectly aligned, the current's going to move you one way, the wind's going to move you another way, and you're going to be off quickly. 
But if you keep your head up the entire time, don't put your head down, head up and micro pivots, my little tiny course corrections, then you'll stay in alignment, even when big things can happen, like a reef that's in front of you and you have to navigate around it. But you can do it when you have your head up. So I would say keep your head up and learn the art of the pivot to stay in alignment with the stars that you cannot control. Stay aligned with the stars that you cannot control. Yeah. Learn to micro pivot. It's great. That's it so far. It's great. <laughs> um, we just heard a really, really great presentation on video. And oh, you my video question guys. for you yeah. is how have you used video to utilize your business? Yeah, I totally didn't do any of that stuff. <laughs> Can I just tell you? So when I sold my fifth tech company, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I was whining to a friend of mine at lunch, and I was telling him, because I actually wrote a resume, which I've never had in my life, you know. I've always started my own thing. And I thought, you know, maybe I should join an existing team, or uh, maybe I don't have to start another company. And so I was, wrote the resume, and I read the thing, and I got done, and I looked at it, and I thought, yeah. This is accurate, but it's not who I am, and it's not what I'm about. And so I was a little disappointed. And so I was whining to my friend at lunch, and, he said, and I told him, I said, you know, what's interesting and, and worthwhile about my career is the stuff that's not on my resume. Mm. And he said, oh, you got to write about that. And I'm like, I'm not going to write that stuff. That, get, that gets indexed. It'll be there forever. But maybe video. So this is my first thing with the vi video. And so I contacted everybody and said, oh, okay, you know, how are you doing the video? These are the popular yeah. LinkedIn video types. I contacted them all, and they're all like, keep it short, keep it simple. I heard the same from you. Short and simple. And I thought, you know, short and simple is not going to work for me because of what I want to say. Yeah. And so I went long and complicated. And I just, I did an outline. I didn't do a script. I said, I, I, I wrote down what I wanted to talk about. And I thought, well, it would be interesting to say, how, you know, I had these three goals when I was 21 and then how I got into tech and how I started my first company, ultimately selling in a seven-figure deal, and that was my 20s. I thought, well, that would be a nice start. So I came up with this series on LinkedIn called What's Not on My Resume, <laughs> and I turned on the camera, and I had my outline, and I just talked. And when I got done, I went click, and it was like seven and a half minutes. And I thought, well, that's it. Take one, that's it. And so I, I know how to vi edit, edit video. That comes from, you know, having to do all those trailers for the movies for that in-room entertainment system. <laughs> Nobody wanted to learn video editing, so I got stuck with it. So I, I've done hundreds of trailers. You know, that's to pull out the coming this summer. Who cares about that when the movie's already been out? So I put in the subtitles, and I put some imagery in it, so it would pop up a little picture when I was talking about something and whatever, and then I got done, and I, I posted it on a holiday weekend. Who does that? It's insane. <laughs> You, you post Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, not on Saturday of a holiday weekend, Monday being the holiday. Mm. I didn't think anybody would watch it, but I didn't care. To me, it was just an experiment. Mm. I wanted to do it, and I did it. And I put it out there, and a few hours later, it was probably at noon I put it out on that Saturday, and I only had like 200 connections on LinkedIn, nobody, you know, just people I really knew. And I think by 6 p.m., I looked back, and I had 4,000 views. Hmm. And I'm like, what? And then it went nuts from there. And so then I had to do my 30s. <laughs> so I did 30s, and that was 9 minutes and 45 seconds. That was even worse. So I was going the wrong way. But it was like a cult following, people. I just, I talked about everything. I said, look, because I can't really separate me as a person and me in my family and me in my business because hmm. it's me. So I just talked about things. But I made sure at the end I always brought it back to takeaways in business. I, I always did that. And I felt like that was really important because that's what I do. My mind is weird. I, if I go into any company or even a restaurant, my mind is always thinking. It's racing. What are they doing? How are they doing it? How could it be better? Could I do it better? Mm. I can't turn it off. Isn't that weird? <laughs> no. It's just the way I am. I'm wired that way. And I'm quite happy doing it because I, I, I come up with great ideas. And then I go, wow, I can take that one and put it for what I do. 
So well, I like that. What's not on my resume? I love that you mentioned earlier that there's a lot of very high level, very quick, fast videos, and they tell you kind of principles, yeah. but they don't get down in the trenches with you. How you and it, it sounds like that's what you're doing. Well, I like to do that. And I do that today. I mean, I still you know, will go and see any company and spend time with them and tell them what I think. That's great. Um, as long as I have time. <laughs> I love that. In your What's Not In My Resume videos, is there um, a video that goes into funding at all and how to acquire funding, where nope. to spend funding? No, nope. I'm a, I'm a, I love to bootstrap, so uh, I'm a big proponent of bootstrapping. I didn't on the two hardware ones, but these people actually came to me and they said, uh, would you take our money? And I kept saying no. And then mm -hmm. when I did the hardware play, I said, okay, maybe. <laughs> and they were angel, one angel investor in company number four, one angel investor in company number five, and they were both seven-figure investments. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, you know, it was a situation where I sat down and said, well, this is what I think, and the person said, great, and I've always wanted to do a, a tech investment. And I said, well, <laughs> you understand, you're not investing in Robert Bishop, you're investing in this idea. And, yeah. and I went through the whole accredited investor-type conversation and got to the end, and the guy wrote me the check and handed it to me and said, uh, well, Robert, thank you, but I'm really investing in you. And he went and just reversed everything I just said. Oh. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a whole new level of stress when you take someone's money. And, and I would say when it comes to startup capital, you need to, be very, you need to treat it like it's sacred. At, like it belongs, I've said this before, like it belongs to your spouse and you want to stay married, okay? <laughs> That's how you should treat it. So get $5 <laughs> of value for every dollar you spend mm. and don't commingle and be stupid and use a company card on a personal purchase or any of that junk. It will bite you big time later. Treat your capital like it's your spouse's money. And you want to stay, stay, stay married. I want to stay married. You know, I got remarried, so I feel very fortunate. I wake up every day and I'm like, can't believe it. It's Lucky great. guy. Well, um, who would marry a guy with five kids that had a 50% chance of dying? <laughs> Seriously, when I was thinking, uh, when I was, you know, after my wife passed away, I was thinking, there's no woman. I will never find anybody. I will be alone. I, I totally expected that. And then I, and then I did. It's funny how that higher power works. Crazy how it works. Yeah. Stars align. All kinds of things. Keep yeah. your head up. Yeah, I could never have orchestrated that. <laughs> um, you spoke in Italian earlier. I can't ignore it. La bella Italia, yes. So is that a passion, learning languages? You mentioned you like to cycle. What are some outside of work passions that you have? So, yeah, I have those. Um, I've always, between starts, taken time off. And then what I like to do is take the family somewhere where they don't speak English <laughs> and live for a little while. So the last time we went to Italy, spent two, two and a half years there, threw the kids in public schools, <laughs> and uh, we had the time of our lives. And, and that, it's also because really I don't care about assets um, I kind of changed, you know, I wanted to be a tech magnate when I was l younger, and right now I don't care about that at all. I wanted to create life experience for my kids in case their life was cut short. Mm. That's what I cared about. And that's really all I do today, is on the one hand, fund research to find a cure, and on the other hand, do stuff that, that, that will bring memories. So I, I don't own homes, even one home. I've never invested in that, um, 401ks, any of that stuff, because that does not meet what it is I'm trying to do. I, I do uh, life experience, which I'm very passionate about. I, my latest passion is uh, of, the, of, the ki of the five kids that you know, had a flip of the coin, chance of getting that gene that would kill them. We were very fortunate that only one child got this. And uh, he's not to the age where his decline will take place, uh, but he's within just a few years, two, four years. And a couple years ago, he came to me and he said, hey, Dad, uh, do you think we could ride the Logan to Jackson race together? Now, I don't know if you know what the Lodija is, but that's 206 miles and 10,000 feet of vertical climb. It is, like, horrible. And I'm like an endurance cyclist, been doing it for decades, and it kills me. 
And I've done it a few times. And in my mind, I'm thinking, son, I remember you whining when there was a 30-mile bike ride in Scouts <laughs> the whole way. And you're going to want to do this? And so I asked him, I said, look, tell me why you want to do this. And he said, I want to do something impossible before I can't do anything at all. And what are you going to do? And I have always embraced, and I say this, don't ever waste a perfectly good crisis. There are opportunities to learn, to teach, to do. So in this case, I went to a friend, and I, because I knew there's no way he can do it on a solo bike. He's a, a lovable nerd. He's not an athlete at all. He weighs a buck 40. He's six foot and a half inch. Yeah. He's going to ride 206 miles. So we got a tandem racing bike from a friend. And I went back and I said, son, you and I, we're going to ride this every Saturday. We're going to go 100 miles every Saturday for 16 weeks. And if we do that, I think we can get to the finish line. And that's exactly what we did. And we did 100 to 150 miles on those Saturdays as we built up. And between 2,000 and 12,000 vertical climb to prepare for that one day. Huh. And then 6 a.m. rolled around and they sent the tandem racing group off and first, because they're so dang slow. <laughs> and all I wanted to do was get across the finish line. And so we, we paced ourselves and did what we wanted. And uh, I was paying no attention to anybody else, to where they were or where we were. And I was so proud when we crossed that line. I thought, this is a memory that that disease will never take from him. And then I asked my wife, so, because I'm, you know, I'm competitive. <laughs> Honey, how did we do? I thought we were dead last. She said, well, you came in second place. I'm like, no way. So we stood on the podium the next day. It, was, it could not happen. It couldn't be done. And I tell people that racing an endurance event is a lot like running a business. It's the mind that gives up first. You have to be able to say to yourself, you can do it, you can do it, even when everything is screaming at you to stop. Does that help at all? Yes. I mean, right there, that's it. That's entrepreneurship. That's great. I'd, I'd like to open it up for audience questions now. So if you have a question, go ahead and raise your hand and then just wait for the microphone. Any questions? Boy, I did a fabulous job, but there's no questions. Not too good, there's one. No. <laughs> yeah, so uh, what you were saying, how the mind gives up first. Yes. Um, what have you done in the past to kind of stay motivated? I know that we're all motivated by our projects and or our product and what we're pushing, but there are inevitably days that, uh, you know, it's hard to put one foot in front of the other. Absolutely. What did you do to kind of overcome those humps? You put one foot in front of the other. A lot of times, think of it like a tunnel. If the tunnel is straight, you can see the light from way far back. But sometimes, you're just in the dark. It bends a little bit. And you don't really see the light until you get right to the end. And so what you have to do, even though you're in darkness, is to take a step. Take a step, then take another step. You don't have to get to the goal. You just have to take a step. It's not so hard to take a step. It's when you feel overwhelmed with all the stuff and boil it down to what can I do today to move this thing forward? And if you're blocked here, then you go work on this. And eventually you'll do this and you'll see that light. So yeah, it's, that's what you have to do. You have to take a step. Great. Do we have another question? Yeah, over here. Um, there's nice T-shirt. Hey, thank you. You're welcome. There's been a lot of change that we've been hearing in the last few years of criticisms against serial entrepreneurship of people who say, like in Utah, it's people who don't take it the distance. They they have the habit of just doing a little bit with their businesses and never actually go the distance. What? What's your viewpoint since you've been on the opposite side of that? Well, I've never, I've never gone the IPO route, okay? Because I never built a family of products. I built a product 
And I knew when I got started with each thing that I was doing what my end game was. Mm. And then I made strategic moves to get to that end game. To me, it was always acquisition. It wasn't market share. It wasn't a revenue goal. It was to be acquired. And so I would set up the strategic relationships knowing that one of them would probably be the one that acquired us. And then I'd pretend like I didn't want to be acquired. And that's kind of secret. Uh, seriously, I remember once uh, I went to a trade show and we'd never been to that trade show before and it was in a new industry. And I came up with this idea and I, it, and I did a button that we handed out to all the attendees and all the button said on it was not from Microsoft. That was it. And it had the little booth number way down at the bottom. And in those days, everybody hated Microsoft because they were trying to buy their way into every market in, on the planet. And so everybody wore the button. <laughs> everybody. I mean, competitors, everybody. It was hilarious. The company that we were exhibiting with was one of my target could acquire us people. And after the first day of the trade show, it was just obvious that we owned that show as a nobody in a big company's booth. Nobody, nobody had ever heard of us. They asked me to go to dinner. And they said, uh, I remember the guy, he goes, I've been authorized to offer you X million dollars for your company. And I'm like, what? And he thought it wasn't enough. So he throws a few more million on. He says, well, what about this number? And I'm like, stop. Where are you getting that number? It's like, well, we assume you have this many installed base and you have this many new customers, users every month. And so we are factoring that back. And I said, well, I know those numbers and you're light. This is our installed base and this is our... He gets his calculator out and he goes, eh, okay, that's over the number I'm authorized to, but would you take a few more million and call it done? That's literally the negotiation how it went. Wow. And I said, okay, but you understand you're not buying gold desks and supercomputers. You're buying a technology. It, it, it's an original work of, auth of authorship. Mm. You know, we own it. We wrote it. But it's not, you know, we don't have a ton of assets. Oh, yeah, no, we get that. And then I, and then I did my, 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 one of my famous things. that I, It just came to me in the moment. And I said, well, how are you going to do this transaction? I said, well, we're, we're a public company. We're going to trade your stock that's not worth anything for a stock that you can sell. So we'll take the price and divide it by number of shares. And our, I'm like, okay, but can I sell the shares like day one? No, no, no. You have to wait 90 days because we have to report our earnings together. And it's called a pooling of interest that doesn't exist anymore. I said, well, what if the stock goes down? And he's like, oh, look. Look at our chart. And he showed me me, 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 going up. And I said, yeah, yeah. But I have a friend, he sold his company for 60 million bucks and he got locked and by the time he could actually sell his shares, he made 6 million. That's like 10 cents on the dollar. So I was being the naive guy. And uh, he said, well, how about if it goes down 20% between the time we sign the deal and the time that you can sell your shares, we'll kick in 20% more shares. And I'm like, well, that's, that's saying something. Thank you very much. Well, how are you going to price it? Well, our stock's at 44, so we'll say 40. That's another 10%. I love it because, you know, 10% is like a million, two million, whatever. It's, it's money. And I said, okay, thank you. And so we priced the deal, and we did the deal. And seriously, I kid you not, the very day before I could trade the shares, now the deal was priced at $40 a share. It went to 31 and 7 eighths, which is exactly what it needed to be to get 20% more shares. And then promptly went up to 57. <laughs> Those are really good days. <laughs> you know? And I'm like selling all the way up. I think I sold a massive block at 48 and another one at 54. And I'm just totally happy. And now they took the tech that we, that they acquired from us, they packaged it with what they did and sold it to Intel for nine figures. Mm. And I could care less. You know, that's another thing that I would say, bird in the hand. You know, bird in the hand today. You never know what's going to happen tomorrow. The, the likelihood of you being the unicorn and going all that whole way and IPOing or getting bought for a bazillion dollars, you know, in some last minute transaction that recently took place, that, those things just don't happen. You know, I know they do, but they just don't. So don't plan on that. Am I answering your question at all? Great, yeah. All right. Because <laughs> it's important to get an answer. I could do rah-rah, though, if you want. 
Perfect. We have one more question back here. So you said you would always bootstrap software. I did. Um, so can you maybe explain that a little? What if you don't actually have living expenses? What if you don't have a, a, this, this strong software capability? You have only some software development capability. How do, how do you... How do you go about bootstrapping software in those situations? Yeah, so here's the thing. Uh, have a job, something that meets your nut, the, your monthly overhead. Have a, have a job. And when your side work, your side gig, whatever that thing is, earns as much as what you have in your day job, then you can quit your day job. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the first thing. The second thing is always have six months of cash uh, at your lowest overhead, what you can scale down to and still live, make sure you have six months because you may want to climb that cliff and if you fall, it's no big deal, but you don't want to drag your wife and your kids down or your spouse and your family down with it. Mm -hmm. And you don't use that for business. That's just the little thing that keeps you okay so that you can have the proper time to find the job if things don't go the way that you planned. Bootstrapping software, you can actually start with kind of manual things. You can kind of look at what is it going to be like. You can wireframe the thing up. You don't have to be very technical in today's world. There's lots of tools that are out there where you can kind of create your screens and then you can walk them through, okay, if you push here, or you can hand it to them and say, well, what would you push? And then you see where they would touch the screen. It's not even real. It's just a, an image. And, and they, oh, they touched this. Well, what did you mean when you did that? What were you trying to do? And then you, you'll get what, you'll, it's so much more important to measure twice and cut once. Don't build the thing until it's ready to scale. Because mm. just don't vet everything else. That's so, have a job. Except in the case of hardware. I'm telling you, hardware requires investment. Okay. Did we do okay? We did great. We yeah. did great. We have one more question from Rev Road. It's our tradition question. All right. What is something fun that your success has allowed you to do? Oh, well, <laughs> you know, going to Italy was a blast. <laughs> so I would say uh, the most recent trip that we did, my, my wife and children are actually in Italy for the summer right now, and I'm here, the lone man in the dreary wilderness. <laughs> so, oh. it, <laughs> And I'm moving. Can you believe it? I know. They I'm left you. You're moving. I'm moving by myself the entire <laughs> house from one to another. Oh, it's the worst. Hey, what are you all doing later? <laughs> Helping you move. Because <laughs> I, I got something. If you want to do service, remember I was talking about service earlier <laughs> and give back. And my back hurts. So if you could give your back, <laughs> that'd be really great. So no, I think that's it. Pretty much the, the, to take the time off. I, I've... It, it, Startups are kind of consuming, you know. I've never had the eight to five startup. I, I've had the, okay, I'll do my best. Like, I'll be with the family in the morning, and then I'll go to work, and then I'll come home at a reasonable time, and I'll spend time with them, and mm -hmm. then everybody goes to bed, and then I work. Because, you know, my wife and children could care less what I'm doing when they're sleeping. You know, if I'm working, they don't care. So I've done a lot of that to maximize family time at the same time, but I put in a ton of hours. You have to work hard. Yeah. And if you're not willing to, then you shouldn't try to be entrepreneur guy. And, oh, here, let me just say two, two quick things. First of all, until you're profitable, you're not an entrepreneur. You're what I call an entrepreneur, okay? Because <laughs> that's what you're in, Okay. And the second thing is, the age of 40 is not somehow the magical age of incompetence in the tech sector, okay? There are people that are over 40 that actually know what the freak they're doing. Can I just say that? Because yes. technically speaking, I could plow most people in this room under. And the last two starts that I've done have been in my 50s. But I find it strange because I hear all the time in this whole corridor here about this whole ageism thing. And I think it's ridiculous. Can I just say that? Yes. Well said.
Well, thank you for joining us. So Robert. hire an old busted guy. <laughs> We're glad to have you. You hang out. We have a special gift for you, but let's give it up for Robert one more time. Oh. Thanks. Thank you. It's been an honor. Oh, it's been great having you here. It's an honor. Um, just so you all know, when I first had the opportunity to meet with Robert, uh, it was very clear that he was someone that we wanted to have come and speak. Uh, every time you come to RevU, you'll hear from wonderful entrepreneurs who share great principles and examples and exactly what they did, and we can all learn from those things. But to me, part of the reason we do this, it's a little bit of a head fake. You'll find a lot of successful, very well-known entrepreneurs that get invited to speak at lots of things, um, uh, but we're really picky here. We want the people who have done those things, succeeded in those ways and failed, um, but that have also honored their, their spouse, their children, their family, their faith, and maintained those things in wonderful ways. And uh, you're a great example of that. Really appreciate that, Rob. And we've got a gift for you here. This is our Rev Road custom bag. There are oh, very wow. few of these in the world. Actually, and it's stuffed with fun Rev Road uh, memorabilia and cool things. That's really great. Yeah. My, my son would, would use this. OK, good. We hope he will. It's too hip for me. I'm old. <laughs> you're pretty hip. No, I think it's great. It goes Thank well you. with a t-shirt and you. shorts. Thank you. Yes. Appreciate that. All right, let's hear it for Rob. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're awesome. Just a few uh, closing items. Uh, just a reminder: August first will be the next Rev U. Uh, super excited for that. We'll show a. We'll spin up a quick teaser for that here in just a moment. But I really want to thank Rob. I also want to thank Bree and AJ and Tigran. They do such a good job, and our wonderful Rev Road staff. They do a lot to make sure that all, everything goes seamlessly, and you all get the invites. And well, thank you. Well, I'm, we're blessed to have an incredible team, and they're very dedicated to making sure that it's a, a tremendous experience for everyone. All right, so with that, let's spin the video, and as soon as it's done, we're going to go grab lunch. All right, thanks, everybody. Uh, go meet someone new. Introduce yourself to someone you don't know and have some lunch. Thanks. Thanks.